Welcome back to season two, episode one of the Paradox Podcast. We're back. Yay. Yay. <laughs> we were renewed for a second season. It was a, t- a close one. It was, but we made it through. Thanks to everyone for listening and for your support and all of the fantastic responses you've given us so far. Truly, it's been uh, it's been a very positive response. Everywhere we've gone, we've got a lot of good feedback, a lot of uh, good stuff to build on, and uh, we've been surprised, I think. I agree. We have been surprised. Uh, good stuff overall. So, um, Shams, what's been happening? Happy holidays. I mean, it's been a couple of months. Yeah. Uh, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I'm, um, nice Christmas and New Year. Yes, uh, very well rested. Had time to hang hang out with the family and play a lot of games. What, um, what have you been playing then? I've been playing uh, a lot of of, uh, Assassin's Creed Origins. Uh, mm-hmm. It's the first one I've played since Bla- Black Flag. That was the last one I played. Black Flag was four, right? Or? I think it was four. It was the pirate one. Uh, I just finished Origins. It was okay. Uh, I liked it. I played it about 30, 40 hours. Uh, but it, it kind of felt like the game should have been called like Camel's Creed <laughs> or Eagle's Creed or Desert Walker's Creed because it kind of felt like I was doing just about anything except assassinating people yeah so but but i enjoyed it uh, uh and then i've been playing a lot of uh magic the gathering online as usual how about uh, you i am uh, i'm deep into subnautica i love it a, p- a pun a pun uh, is that i you know <laughs> the holidays into... are over that that's that shit is okay doing the holidays <laughs> with your family and all the other low quality jokes you guys do but not <laughs> at the office deep into subnautica <laughs> It's fantastic. It's that uh, obviously a big uh, a, a, a game that's grown very popular since I think it came out of early access just a couple of weeks ago, yep. and it's it, it's I think the most engrossing survival game I've played since I first played Minecraft yeah. when that came out. You know that feeling of discovery, you know, being alone in like this massive world. Yeah. It's it's amazing. I absolutely love it. I've bought it, haven't played it yet. So uh, let's let's move on yeah. then from the puns and and deep jokes. Yeah. So. This season, uh, we're not changing the format that much. We're adding nope. one partic- particular thing to the format, and that's that we're going to bring in guests that is right. from time to time. Not necessarily every episode, but whenever we feel that the, there is need for it and mm-hmm. there's a specific topic we want to tackle, we'll bring in somebody that can shed their insight and, and experience from their side where they're sitting on the business of uh, games. Yeah. So it's still going to be the same focus, uh, illuminating the business side of games, but from different angles. And so you don't just have to listen to our old voices all day long. Yeah, the general idea again of this podcast is sort of, uh, as you said, shed some light on the uh, infernal machine that is video games publishing and perhaps also seem make us seem a little bit less evil and mysterious in the meantime. So that's what we're trying yeah. to do with this. And for the for the first guest, um, yep. who'll be coming on later uh, in the show, uh, but we've got quite a bit of a treat for you guys. It's none other than our own Johan Andersson, the mostiest of a veteran at Paradox, <laughs> you might say. The veteranest of veterans. Yeah, he joined over 20 years ago and he's made um, a lot of our original games, European Resolus, a lot of the sequels. He's been imperative in the design and the business of this company for the past 20 years. He's currently the EVP of Creative Direction, whatever that means, at Paradox <laughs> Development Studio. He will explain that to everyone. Mm. And he oversees and leads all of our designers. Um, yeah, exactly. So, uh, pretty cool to get you on on the show. That's going to be a little bit later, though, because yeah. before that, I thought we'd uh, spend some time going through a bit of listener feedback. Oh, okay. So, uh, recently in our um, uh, ongoing push to reach a massive AAA audience with this podcast, <laughs> okay. we started uploading episodes uh, from last season to one of our YouTube channels. So and per- MySpace, I believe. Really? That's, no. That's, no. Oh, no. Right. You're making a joke there, yes. Charles. Well done. Well done. Uh, Paradox Extra, which is one of our channels on YouTube. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So you know, reaching a new uh, group of listeners, and and it was really interesting to see the reactions to yeah. to those episodes that when yeah, they went yeah, up yeah. on there. We got a lot of great feedback, and we, you know, usually we. You know, we expect to get a lot of good stuff back from our, yeah. uh, you know, from the Paradox audience. We don't didn't quite know exactly what to get back from the podcast, uh, but I mean, you know. YouTube comments is like the final boss of the internet, right? That's the <laughs> that's, that's exactly the, what it is. <laughs> secret uh, bonus level, yeah. And the the one that maybe garnered the most uh, uh, 
was one of the most controversial episodes that we uploaded. Yeah, the right? episode we did on loot boxes uh, last, I think in November, uh, got a lot of attention. So first of all, big surprise. Yeah. People don't like loot boxes. No, big, huge big surprise. surprise, right? But I, but I also would like to give some kudos to the community, you know. Especially on YouTube, you yes. do not necessarily expect to have a civil discourse. Yeah. But not only did we have a civil discourse among the comments on that YouTube video, but it actually led to a lot of you know insights, at least on my part. But also, I think we might have opened some eyes on there as well. Yeah, I agree, and this is this is why I, I one of the reasons I, I love working for for Paradox is uh, the fact that we have a community that is so invested and engaged in what we do, and they have a lot of intelligent uh, stuff. Uh, they always bring a lot of intelligent stuff to the to the conversation that we no, don't necessarily think of. So, so thank you, everyone. And I think a couple of points that were raised yeah. that we want to bring up here. Do you want to sure. do you want to start? I can start. Uh, one of the one of the points that at least struck me was regarding the gambling aspect. And again, this might sound asinine, but you know, we we understood or have are obviously aware and know that people just don't, generally don't like loot boxes. But there's more to unpack here than just the general dislike yeah. of the loot boxes. And throughout the very close conversations I had with a lot of people on the, with the chats there, it dawned on me that a big part of people not liking loot boxes is the monetization part. People just hate having to pay more for more stuff. That's yeah. one thing, and that's the part I kind of don't agree with. But the other aspect that kind of dawned on me was that a huge reason why a lot of people just are vehemently opposed to loot boxes is because it's gambling in their eyes. Yeah, there's, and, there's this principle, this fundamental disagreement with gambling, right? Yeah, That's exactly. Way to make money. Yeah, exactly. And and it is a principled stance about the predatory practices of gambling, and uh, that you know, I I think I I knew it was there, but I underestimated how many just mm. didn't talk about like I I don't care about cosmetics or upselling. I just don't care about gambling, and that you know. Uh, I, I don't like gambling myself. I don't invest in gambling. I'm kind of opposed to it. But it was an aspect that I kind of, I hadn't, at least to me, I, I maybe based it too much on a personal sense that I don't see the problem with loot boxes being gambling because I don't find that addicting. Mm. But that aspect was uh, something that many others raised. Yeah, and that's something that I think we will be taking into account when we sort of talk further on this as well. That's a, that's an important point that was raised. Uh, the second thing is we made this sort of offhand remark uh, about the the dinosaurs of the industry. Uh, we used that as an example of like uh, traditional uh, games development and traditional games audiences. Uh, and and so, uh, a user on YouTube made the point that perhaps our audience for our games is these dinosaurs. Yeah. And I, I, of course, using that word with love and respect here, but but uh, the point was made that perhaps we are underestimating the risk that changing monetization uh, models poses to our current fan base. And that yeah. a lot of people would you know, simply be very sad to stop playing our games because they, lo they like the games, but they disagree with how we choose to make money from them or yeah. offer them. And I think that's, again, a very fair point. And uh, I think what I want to say is that uh, it sounds, it's a, bit cheesy to come it's an apology i suppose but it's it was never our intention to sort of come off as dismissive towards our own players and yeah that's that's something we would never do no, of course. especially since we i mean we are dinosaurs ourselves yeah, like it's not exactly. like we sit around all day long just buying loot boxes and like ha 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 we just love monetizing <laughs> loot boxes and other games yeah. we play all of these hardcore pc games ourselves and f feel the frustration with loot boxes but we also kind of approach it from the other side and figuring out that you know it, it is ultimately a business and there are things that are changing in the business yeah this is a podcast by dinosaurs for dinosaurs right <laughs> that, yeah. that's a very good yeah. way of describing it but yeah. and you know it's not like randomized purchases are any it's not a holy grail by any means it's you know the holy grail is ultimately having players that are more happy and spending more in the game and that's yeah. try to, that's the kind of thing we want to uh, get to and we talked a lot about the challenges that need to be overcome in monetization and part of that discussion needs to happen with you guys to keep you happy and as long as you're happy the more happy you are the more you'll spend and that makes us happy so there's a good circle there yeah i mean the challenge is sort of looking beyond the uh, less than great ways of uh, how monetization is perhaps being employed uh, additional monetization methods are being employed in other parts of the industry and sort of finding ways of doing it that works for everyone. You know, happy players means we sell more games, which exactly. is what we want to do. Um, yeah. <clears throat> we, uh, 
what else? Yeah, uh-huh. so uh, uh, another good point that was raised was the fact that people do not like the combination of full-priced releases and then additional ah, right. monetization on top of that in the form of loot boxes. And again, a fair point, uh, not necessarily because it's too expensive, because I don't necessarily agree that there is such a thing as you know a fair price for a game. <laughs> But simply, be, it's, a, it's a problem of perception, right? Something like that easily comes across as a bit greedy by the developer, which mm, I think right. is an important thing to take into account. Yeah, sure. On that point, if I can point out, um, and this is on the point of greed, I think throughout several comments, and I'm not saying that everyone was saying this, but it was raised on several times, uh, and some people seem to be alluding to the fact that a company like Paradox or Blizzard should not be making additional monetization schemes to begin with, because mm-hmm. they're already so profitable. Um, you're making so much money, so why are you trying to make even more money? That's the argument that was put forward. Exactly. Yeah. Like, Why did then adding these things? Yeah. And I just want to point out that I, I at least personally object to this quite strongly, and I don't want to get into a big political discussion uh, about this. We can save that for PDXCon and the people <laughs> workers that... Workers controlling the means of production. <laughs> exactly. It's not about the workers controlling the means of production. And I don't... Sh- but I vehemently against the idea that the conceptually there is a limit to how much you should be able to take home and profit yeah it doesn't work that way don't believe that we don't operate again towards that principle 98 percent of i think the industry doesn't work according there everyone's here to do you know run a business and generate a profit and try to make as much money to as possible you know the concept of too much money doesn't exist that is why businesses exist to make too much money yeah that's and if you start imposing I think at least if you start imposing uh, limits on this, you would see some kind of fundamental breakdown of the industry as we see it because that's not mm. what the driving factor behind the industry is to make too much money. Yeah. If you remove that from the fact you stop seeing a lot of the ancillary or the benefits from you see uh, from having those kind of schemes. Yeah, you're just basically being upfront about the fact that uh, this whole industry exists because of it's a it's a business, right? Yeah, That's exactly. That you, you need to just accept that to have a, a, a useful discussion about these things. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's ultimately again as we keep harping on, it's not about monetization. It's about what kind of monetization that makes mm-hmm. sense. Mm-hmm. And I think somebody ultimately said that it's it's so scary to see now that the suits are running paradox, <laughs> how everything has changed <laughs> compared to how the designers were running things a few years ago. Well, they tell me, like, A, if we're the suits, then everyone at Paradox are suits. Yeah. Or B, you haven't quite been looking really closely at what the designers have been wearing uh, all these years. Uh, you, you, and your wearing is kind of not to be taken literally. <laughs> like people don't exactly. wear suits, but you're talking about suits as in the, you know, being a, the corporate, uh, being a business-oriented person, I douchebag. suppose. Douchebag, yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. It's been the same all along, right? Yeah. The difference is I think we're talking about it. Yeah. Cool. All right, final note then. Thank you so much for all of your insights and comments so far. Uh, again, it feels good and it re- it's really helping us develop and sort of test our thoughts and ideas on on, on people here. So keep it coming. Uh, help us figure out what you want from us so we can give that to you so we can make more money. Yeah. Speaking of game designers that like to make money, uh, we now have Johan Andersson in the in the studio with us. Hi, how are you doing? Pretty good, pretty good. Welcome to the podcast. You're the first guest we have here. Oh, it's a, what it's, an honor. It, it is. It, it doesn't feel like an honor now, but it will feel like an honor when you see the other guests we have lined up. And I just hyped, <laughs> hyped ourselves up quite considerably. But we're happy to have you here because we think that you perfectly bridge the gap of uh, between two things that we've been discussing throughout the first season and we'll be continuing to discuss uh, in the second season. Yeah. There's always this conception of like you have uh, business people on one side and you have then designers and game uh, people on one side. But I think that one of the strengths of Paradox has always been that these have been the same for many years and that's largely been thanks to you. But before we get to that, let's give people a bit of a, an overview of your history. Where do you come from and how the hell did you end up sitting in this chair? Uh, in a brief version. <laughs> well, uh, Shams just found me on the street five minutes. No, uh, <laughs> seriously. Uh, I've been in the industry for since the 94, the good old days when Sweden was good in football. Um, and I've been started as a programmer, um, worked at Funcom for a while and started my own company and went belly up, learned that business is important. And I've been here at Paradox since the start, one of the founders. And been leading up the internal studio for 20 years here at Paradox yeah. now. 
So you you were here from the start, and you um, obviously you are the uh, the the original creator of the Europa Universalis game series. Yeah, and Hartshire and then Vicky and all a couple of, of other ones. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and your current uh, title is Executive Vice President of Creative Direction. Is that correct? Yeah. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean? It's just a fancy title for being. Uh, t- I mean, I usually when I credit myself in the games, I write creative director. Mm. But for a long while, we had the rule that nobody could have the title uh, creative in their title. Oh. Yeah. And then we that you know that changed over time. <laughs> yes. Because every, Fred said that uh, everyone should always be called creative if you work in a game company, unless you're in. Accounting. <laughs> okay. Right. So what does, what does, does the role entail for you today, the day-to-day? Uh, I'm Bruce. currently leading the uh, game directors, which are basically a bunch of very multi-class people because yep. they're in charge of the entire project, the vision, the overarching game design, the budget, the, to do the marketing for it. They're like weird, cool individuals that stand up on the barricades and tell you how awesome the games are that yeah. they want to make. So in a, and in a paradox context the game the game director is very much the, the sort of owner of the project. Yeah, the pro, you could say product owner in, yeah. from an agile perspective. Okay. When we talk about the aspect of uh, you know business, how would you say the integration of business or a business sense has been integrated into the work that you do on the creative side compared over the years? Oh, um, I think it all starts back in the days when you're a small company and you realize the important aspect that every dollar counts. Yeah. So you can be able to pay salaries the next month and so on. So you all, so you've realized that business is important for game design. You have to think about what sells, yeah. what sells long term, and how do you utilize the long tail of our games to earn money long term. Yeah. Because one of the funny things I discovered was that when we made EU2, was that people kept playing it and playing it and playing it for a long time. No. But we did not earn more money from them playing it for a long time. Okay. And that was one thing we really wanted to crack. Yeah. Yeah. So we started with uh, expansions. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So there wasn't the you didn't sit down and say let's create a business model that allows us to upsell as much as possible. You started with a game idea. The design was in the driving seat. So you created a game that was really addictive, and then you came back to well, wait. If people are playing it this much, how can we monetize more? Yeah. Okay. So I think this maybe answers the because I had a question that came in via Twitter. Uh, someone asked if you could or if we could give an example of on this topic, an example of where uh, game design has been affected by what makes sense from a business perspective or vice versa. I, that is like, when did we make a decision that had to do with the design of the game based on, yeah, what would make sense from a business perspective? What, uh, the easy answer is always. <laughs> right. But, um, we, we've been working back in the old days when Paradox had a little bit less money and smaller teams we worked very much with like time boxing and yeah we have x amount of money we can only spend it on this game we designed the game out of the budget we can have and then we release it and yeah. then so that's how budgets and business limited the, the design yeah but then when we realized with the new uh, business models we've had with the dlc system and so on uh, we realized that, yeah, we can make a game, and then as long as we make it modular enough so that we can keep building upon it, we can keep creating new products that earn money. Um, when we have this business model, it means that we it defines the limits of how we make the designs. We do not make big, huge, overarching systems. We make modular systems so that people can see what to purchase and that increases the amount of money. So let me ask you, so one of the um, interesting conversations that we had with people on the forums and Twitter and Reddit uh, during last year when we had our kind of pricing uh, issue and Mm. the overall issue of our DLC business model kind of popped up. One of the my main takeaways from that discussion was trying to maintain a balance between what you give away for free in the game yeah, uh, as free updates, and what do you pull in, put in the expansions that are make the expansions interesting enough that people want to pay money for them, 
but you don't end up paywalling some of the features. How do you find a balance there? And I know it's really hard. Uh, yeah, I'm. Uh, I like paywalls. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm this a, is where we come back to the what the designers, what kind of suits the designers were wearing. <laughs> I mean, I, I like paywalls for to make people pay. Yeah, um, it's that simple. It's we've done that in plenty of our game design is that uh, important features should be behind the paywall. And yeah. I'm brutally honest in our game design things that this should be paywall because that will increase our revenue. Sure, our revenue makes us be able to spend more resources and make better products. But, but how do you find that balance? Because if you put every single no. feature... Uh, you, don't, you don't put every single feature. You identify which are the most important features. Yeah. Let's say um, one expansion we made, there's a few years ago called Common Sense for EU4. Yeah. Uh, there's always people whining about... Uh, that's a bad Construct, word. Constructively <laughs> expressing uh, their opinions. Uh, that, <laughs> no, this should be free. It's so important. I'm like, yes, if it's this important, then it's worth paying for. That's a fair point. But I think what you're getting to here, Shams, is yeah. like how, because we also always talk about like the, you know, it's a misconception that you need to buy all of our expansions to enjoy I, our games. I mean, right? I mean Cru- Crusader Kings is called Crusader Kings, right? It's yeah. not called Muslim Rulers. That's my con- no. constant yeah. point. Like the Sword of Islam expansion pack is for in in is for you to enjoy CK in another way, right? Yeah. But then let's say that I don't know, I don't remember when retinues were, for, for instance, in, introduced to the to Crusader Kings. A legacy of Rome. Yeah, exactly. And if you didn't get that expansion, did you still get retinues? No. No. But retinues became a very integral part of how the games was played. It like it could be a very important part of your strategy. Yeah, but it's not that important compared to things like estates in U four. Uh, development in EU4 and we yeah. be- and but i mean sometimes you i'm guessing that you guys put something in a i think that ultimately where people become frustrated is that if if, if we say on one hand you don't have to buy the DLC vote with your wallet yeah and then we uh, release an expansion or something that introduces something in the game that makes the game so vastly superior or more of an enjoyable experience, or not even that, let's say that the base game has some flaws, because obviously complex systems have these complex flaws, that you end up with a situation where the the base game ends up being not inferior because of, I didn't get the fancy leather coating for my you know car seats, mm. but it's just a very different product. Do, do you end up retconning where you just, because I believe that retinues, for instance, is now in the base game. I do not know. Okay. Uh, I think it's still paywall because... For reasons. Yeah. But I believe that overarching systems that affects everything should be free, like the new technology system. Yeah. In, or it's technically not free. It's those that don't pay for the expansions get it subsidized by those who pay for yeah, the expansions. Yeah. But um, tech system does things that should be free. Uh, improved AI should be free. Base game, life, quality of life improvements. Not all quality of life. Uh, new UIs that makes it easier to play, like yeah. our diplomatic macro builder, yeah. the way you can see who, who tell with. That's something you pay for because you get quality of life. We identified uh, recently that there's three things that should be paid for. Uh, quality of life things. Mm-hmm. Um, things that gives you more power. And uh, things that gives you more flavor. Okay. Um, because we did, we did a lot of like service on the forums with thousands upon thousands of replies, uh, looking at the EU4 expansions, and basically, the most popular ones and the people thought was the best were the ones that were categorized at, at that, like new, new UI features people loved, things that gave you more power, not necessarily more powerful, but more power in that uh, you got more control over things. That was where people thought was a great uh, mm. pay feature. And of course, flavor that makes something unique. So you can go to another area and play another country and yeah. 
Yeah, okay. All right. So let me ask you this. We, we've uh, spent a lot of time in this podcast talking about uh, monetization methods of the future and sort of how not just our business model, but the way the games industry makes money in general evolves over time. And I think specifically in light of the sort of recent controversies around loot boxes, what are your thoughts on how uh, monetization in games is likely to uh, change in the future. What are your thoughts on I, that? I think this is particularly interesting because you, as a gamer yourself, you play a lot of the Blizzard games. You play a lot of Hearthstone, a lot of World of Warcraft, right? Yeah, that's right. And and, and sort of, what do you think that would will mean for Paradox in the long term going forward? I've been spending the last two or three years trying to figure out some new ideas of monetization. Yeah, and I don't have any good ideas because. <sighs> Feels like most things have been tried. I am not a fan of loot boxes. No. Why not? Because it's gambling. But you play Hearthstone. I play Hearthstone, and I spend. I have to limit myself. I'm not exactly. I don't exactly have a low salary these days, but I still have to limit myself to only spend X amount of money. Mm. Sure. Because it's gambling and it's an addiction so um, what's well, like, you know getting into philosophical differences uh, but what's the difference between that and doing a, a a raid run in the world of warcraft and hoping to get the right drop yeah because uh, this is real life money spending more money um spending spending time is one thing but when i can click on uh okay i click uh and i spend ten dollars and i get I didn't get it. I click again. I no. spend another ten dollars. There's a lot of like uh, addictive personalities that are hurt by that. Yeah. And I I do not say it's evil, and I do not say people should not use it, but I do not like yeah. it, and I do not. Games that have similar methods are not installed on on things where my sure. daughter can play it. And that's the exact same point you kind of made earlier yeah, exactly, when we were yeah. coming back to yeah. like in principle that just you know it, it's an immoral gray zone. Yeah. So on that point about loot boxes and the sort of difficulties when you sort of start to move into things that you could consider gambling, what sort of mitigations do you see for that? How how can that model be, you know, theoretically changed or tweaked to make it more sort of appetizing? I suppose is a, is a word. If I knew that. I would not say that on the podcast and we will probably have it in <laughs> our own plans it, and building it and earning project. money yeah. right. because yeah. exactly. <laughs> that's, that's right. our job. As a it's a tricky one. That's what we spend our days doing, right? Okay, so, so uh, oh. maybe a lighter question then. Yeah. Uh, so we recently celebrated the 20th anniversary of Paradox Development Studio. Or I, think it, it's, I think what we celebrated was that it's been 20 years <laughs> since the first lines of code in Europa Universalis were written. Uh, yeah, the we ones that I, the, the, we... that I had written. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Is that code still there? Yeah, some of it. No, Somewhere not the actual those lines because okay. it was the old console free. But that's a, that's a long time, obviously. Yeah. And my question is, what is it that has made you stick around? What has made you stay with Paradox for so long? Uh, well, I... I <laughs> Just taking you too long to I, answer. I, I, I sound, no, I sound <laughs> a little bit like an arrogant ass, but I view Paradox as my company a bit like of it's course, my right. creation it's like i love working here and i get to make the games i like making and have fun and have good colleagues and i think that a lot of the usual saying is that people stay because of friends and leave because of bad bosses you yeah. generally had pretty good bosses over the years the same as that i've had over the years fred yeah yeah I and or th- matthias i had theo oh theo I, was not yeah. great <laughs> No, it was nice. Oh, you liked it. Okay. Anyway, uh, but you but you've had a lot of friends at the company as well. Yeah, some still working here. Yeah, and uh, it's it's great fun. It's uh, I like working here, but it it wouldn't have just been. I'm not just staying for friends and so on, but it's it's fun making these games. So I like working here. Yeah, cool. All right, uh, we're, we're going from one topic to the other pretty quickly here, but uh, something that's obviously close to my heart since I'm working in, in, in marketing is uh, community management and just the whole sort of community around our games. Uh, one of the things that I really like about being here is this the transparency and the sort of honesty and sort of the openness that we value. And mm. I think the, the podcast is one expression of, uh, of that. And I, I genuinely believe that that's a major 
factor in why we're so successful. Um, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this from a, from a game design perspective. Um, your thoughts on the importance of, uh, you know, community relations and sort of having and interacting with a big community. Because you're extremely active on the, you have been at least very active on the forums, and you you're a vocal person, right? I used to be far more active on the forums back yes. when we were smaller because I like to have total control. Like Emperor Palpatine. <laughs> Much like Emperor Palpatine, yeah. Continue. Yes. Uh, yeah, but and I don't follow the forums all that much because I've been delegating games to other people and so. So I don't read everything, but I love talking to people and explaining what we're doing. Um, now that we have the games that I'm working on, that's not when the games are unannounced, I get like frustrated because I want to tell people constantly and mm. interact with them because... Even if you're, if there's a game that's not released, you can talk about things and people comment and you get so much good feedback from the community. It's really, really great. Without the community, our games would have been shit. Is that something you guys take into account when in sort of a, the early stages of working on a new project, like feedback and sort of ideas to, taken in from the community? Yes. How the, is that made part of the design process? Our design process is a little bit like you guys all pro- probably all love Wheel of Time. Um, yeah. No comment. <laughs> okay. I'm not now, gonna. Uh, the, I'm not the, gonna the, go there. Uh, <laughs> there is a great uh, comment uh, there. Let the Lord of Chaos rule. Uh, anyway, um, our design process is kind of chaotic, yeah. and because I've I think chaos is a great uh, feeding ground for creativity the great unifier yeah <laughs> is that what you would call chaos <laughs> no chaos is like you throw out something you get feedback you get the information and it's like sometimes it's nothing you're really useful sure but it, it has to be a structured chaos of some sort obviously it's not like you like you I, say I, you I, like to I, you like to have control over things it's not no, like I'm, anyone can have any opinion and that no, happens and no it's like I write the development diary and about something and how it's going to work and then I read and read and read and sometimes actually very often people point out things like what about this and oh wouldn't it be cool if we did this and I just keep that archive some things I also go through and reading the suggestion forums for games when I'm working on it and just constantly reading through okay irrelevant 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 oh that makes me think about this irrelevant oh yeah mm, yeah and then you yeah. end up with ideas and things to create yeah right so cool. let me ask so that's, them. A, that's the takeaway for the listener keep keep commenting on those dev diaries right <laughs> yeah, yeah and, and, and post in suggestion forums write things yeah. do mods yeah. uh, I, I, I don't really play our mods because I hardly have time to play the games but I like like reading and browsing, and because it gives me ideas. A, a couple of uh, kind of uh, sh- shorter questions for you. Uh, where do you see Paradox business model being in, in, or Grand Strategy Games being in the year twenty thirty? Like, if you look back twelve years, you maybe I mean, how different are we today? Maybe in some respects a lot, in some respects not at all. Where in twelve years, what's your prediction for Grand Strategy Games? And a lot of people are hoping you won't say free to play games. <laughs> Thank you. I have no idea. Okay. Because I could never dream what we were going to be. Twelve years ago, we were working on the third EU. Yeah. It was our first Clausewitz thing, yeah. and our we were like, yeah, we're releasing things in boxes. Yeah. You remember those little th- things with yeah. the CDs? Well, things made of paper. Uh, exactly. Yeah. I've heard tales of them. If I told you uh, back in 2010 or uh, 8 that we'd be releasing Crusader Kings 2 in 18 and we'd had over $300 worth of DLC in the game, what would you have said back then, do you think? Are people going to pay money for that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's, a, here's, a, here's a question. What's your favorite Paradox game of all time? Uh, I say there's three different ones that are special in my heart. I loved the Hot Shrine 2 because uh, it was a really, really polished release and I was really happy with it. Um, I'd say EU4 has been a real awesome polished pro- product. That's probably the best game we've ever made. Why, why do you think that? Because it's 
the fourth of it iteration, it's a series we've been working with. It's like the perfect strategy game, if I say so myself. Um, the third one, I'd say, oh yeah, that's project that I can't tell you about because it's not announced. Oh, secret project, awesome! Uh, it's <laughs> either Victoria <laughs> Three right or there. Rome Two, obviously. It's one of those. Must be one of those. So let me ask you this then: we we talked about we talked about uh, you know creating a process out of a chaos. So one of your strengths is that you always had a great focus on, not only are you an excellent programmer, you also have a very good design skills, but you also understand business and keep that in the forefront whenever you're designing or coding or creating things. How is that then passed on you know, systematically as the studio has grown from being just mostly you to over 130 people working on the development side? Is that something that's incorporated into the, the recruitment process? Do you make sure that your game directors understand business or how do you help like get other key personnel in the company to understand the importance of the business aspect? We constantly talk about uh, business and ROI and uh, how to maximize uh, the amount of things we can release in a year in the Game Director Forum. Yeah. So it's mostly we talk all about half design, half money in the game director forum but it's rather hard to recruit the game directors because there's not many experienced uh, strategy designers that can make PDS style games yeah what's the requirement for becoming a game designer or a game director at PDS would you say a game designer oh, you need to understand design you need to understand our games you need to have an insane passion and then be able to convince Brad, the design manager, that you're a good fit for the roles. Game directors, that's tougher. It's individual. You need a few years. Most of our game directors have 10 plus years experience. We only have one rookie, Jake, which, who's in charge of E4 these days. He's a rookie. He's only been here in the industry for Three, four years now. Yeah. So, so let me ask you, what what do you think is the biggest misconception uh, from the player side or the market side regarding the creation of the product and the incorporation of business into that aspect? What do you think the biggest misconception is about? Uh, they think we're, I guess, some people think that we're like artists that would be making better products if we had enormous amount of budget and no limitations. But the thing is, it's that limitations are the best things there are for creativity. So you would like us to put more business requirements on you? for your No, next not business requirements. Saying? I'm saying limitations. Like time is a good limitation. Yeah, time or money or something like yeah. that, right? Okay. Um, because that's, that forces you. To cool. create things, I'm not. I'm not going to ask you what game you're working on now uh, because I don't want you to say that in the podcast oh, because no. I, uh, <laughs> I want to I work with that. Uh, but I will ask you what kind of stuff would you like to explore in upcoming games from PDS? What kind of direction would you be interested in going? I can't really <laughs> say that much because I'm so much into the <laughs> current game I'm doing. Uh, so, so would like... you guys consider doing like a simulation game more? You know, less towards the grand strategy stuff and more, you know, like a flight simulator. I don't know. I don't think that would be uh, something I would love. From a to, portfolio perspective, I can tell you it would be perfect. I, I would have loved to make a, like an, if I could do whatever game I wanted, Yeah, I would have done taking the story we had in Rune Master and yeah. the World and so on and um, combine it with uh, some sort of like Diablo style gameplay. Ah, so for those of you that uh, weren't around by the time, we, a few years ago we announced a game called Rune Master, which was a real cool Norse-inspired uh, RPG game that had a lot of cool elements to it. It was a really big first for us. It didn't quite hold up, but it had a lot of cool stories and elements to it. So you like to make an action RPG set in a kind of Norse, yeah. hardcore-ish... Because what, what uh, killed that project was that the tactical battles on a hex-based map a la Heroes of Mad Magic style were shite, yeah. crap, I think and we iterated term, yeah. upon it for a year and it wasn't fun. But the story and the world was awesome. And okay. Cool. cool. So uh, we are uh, already way over time, so we're going to try to wrap this up. And mm. as um, 
uh, listeners, uh, experienced listeners, or listeners who have been with us for a while know, we, tr- we, we want to do this thing where we do a top three list in yes. every episode. And we're going to try to continue with that tradition. Yeah. So the question is for you one this time. We're going to ask you for your top three list. And the question is this. If Paradox did not exist, what are the top three games companies you would want to work for instead? Plus a short motivation for each person. Uh, I'd say... Avalanche because Christopher and Linus are nice people, <laughs> and I, I know it's like that's one. Avalanche for for those of you who don't know are literally in the same buildings as we the are. Floor above, just yeah. the floor above. Just the floor above. They used to be part of our company like twenty years ago, and I worked with Linus. So uh, then uh, I guess on the nice people track, I like Jonas and David and those at Raw Fury. So I guess them then. Cool. Uh, Again, for those who don't know, Raw Fury, uh, the game's publisher, was founded by, at least partly by Paradox. Uh, ex- Paradox a lot of ex-Paradox right? yeah. people, yeah. yeah. And then, uh, number one, what company am I a huge fanboy of? What uh, MMO do I, did I spend half an hour this morning grinding dailies in? Starting Online. <laughs> no, World of Warcraft. World it's of like Warcraft. I would kill Shams if I got uh, if I got yeah. a job. But let's he say would the even shark. kill me. Even can you, can you imagine how valuable I am? He wow. went that far. <laughs> okay, all right. Avalanche, Raw Fury, Blizzard. If there's any recruiters listening, it's <laughs> like yeah, yeah, I, I stick or World of Warcraft. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, you want? Thank Good, you so yeah. much. We'll probably have you on board um, down the line as well, especially if we have a topic that we think you could be a hard hitting guest for. Uh, in the meantime, keep working on Rome 2 and Victoria 3 and let's see what happens. <laughs> I thought we were working on Sengoku 2. Sengoku sorry, sorry. Two. Oh, I oh, don't it. say that. <laughs> Is it, it might be EU5. Who knows? <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, thanks, thanks you all for coming on. As always, uh, subscribe if, for you listeners. Subscribe to this podcast. Come back in two weeks for the next episode. We're on iTunes, SoundCloud, pretty much every other podcasting platform out there by now. And let us know who else you would like us to bring in as a guest. Oh, and we're also on YouTube nowadays. So follow us on Paradox Extra on YouTube if you're not doing that already. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.